Well, I developed an interest in the movement um, gradually over the course of many years, and I don't think that it would have happened but for the fact that the movement lasted a very long time and wore me down uh, through my entire formative years. I wasn't born to be interested in politics, let alone black and white politics. Um, I grew up in Atlanta. I was interested in, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I, my father taught that people interested in politics couldn't find honest work. So we were, we were decidedly apolitical. But it so happened that I started first grade in the year of the Brown decision. I did skip a grade and it turned out that I graduated from college this spring that Dr. King was killed. So all my childhood, the movement was, was relentless. And um, as I was growing up, I saw how people reacted to it. Um, and it, it attracted fear, constant fear, but also um, inquisitiveness about how adults were behaving because adult white Atlanta behaved as though they had this all under control. And um, it excited my sarcasm, uh, my skepticism, um, everything. I, so the short answer is that the civil rights movement converted me over the course of a long time. I remember telling my mother, I think it was in 63, that this had been going on for as long as I could remember. I remember the Atlanta temple bombing. I remember the photographs of the early sit-ins, seeing the Klan downtown. Ironically, the first time I ever saw a Klansman in person was at College Park, Maryland <laughs> in 1966 when I, was in, uh, when I was in college. But I saw all the pictures. I wouldn't go downtown. It was, it was scary, so it made you think. Uh, about how deep those issues went and everything was framed in terms of religion. You hear Dr. King's sermons. Um, I knew he was there in town. I knew he made all of the, what we called in Atlanta, the power structure. It's the only city in America where they, where they refer to themselves openly as we and the power structure. Um, th they were rattled by Dr. King and when he got the Nobel Prize, you know, they, they had a conniption about whether, how they should honor him without uh, ruining all their businesses. Um, so anyway, over the course of this, I told my mother that this was really serious and that it went to a lot of deep issues and that I was kind of ashamed at being frightened of it because it was scary and that when I got really old, like 30, I, I, I was going to do something about this. And it seemed cruelly that within a week, um, onto the TV and, and into the newspapers came the pictures of the little girls, mostly girls, marching in Birmingham when the, uh, in May of 63. Um, I spent four chapters in Parting the Waters writing about the development of those children's marches because I do think that it was a pivotal event. Um, and I was just stunned. I said, why aren't these girls waiting? You know, they're singing songs that we sing in Sunday school and they're marching right through these fire hoses. And I'm saying I need to be 30. And um, so I, I do think uh, events like that um, kind of captured my interest against my will. By the time I got to college, um, the civil rights movement was cresting and the, anti, uh, the Vietnam uh, anti-war movement uh, was, was coming along. And, um, in my sophomore year, I, I dropped my pre-med courses and, and started looking for uh, courses that would explain where this came from. I wanted to know where it came from. I wanted to know w w what motivated like these girls so that they could move and have an effect on me. And um, so I started uh, studying uh, those things. I think the first political idea I ever had was that um, um, I told some people in the anti-war movement, which was overwhelmingly white and campus-based, um, that we were copying the civil rights movement uh, in, a, in, a, in a dangerous way, kind of like Pat Broon would copy Little Richard songs. We were covering it. And we got the idea that young people could be important, uh, which was a new idea. You know, the civil rights movement pioneered that, that you could have large numbers of young people down to these eight-year-olds in uh, Birmingham. But that the anti-war movement on campus basically got the idea that you should have lots of meetings and, and um, have a press conference to list your demands and, and then raise hell. And that's about as much as far as we got. And we were 
in danger of, of uh, prolonging the war by being undisciplined in our protests. Uh, and I said, I don't know where the civil rights movement came from, but I think it was more complex than that. So anyway, that's how I got interested in it. So it, it, it became uh, an obsession in a way to know where it came from. And all the books I read were too analytical. And, and I, I wanted a storytelling narrative to help me feel where it came from, from all the points of view of the people, you know, from FBI agents uh, to the demonstrators themselves. Well, it was very difficult. Uh, the, the segregated world, I don't really remember seeing any white and colored signs when I was growing up because our whole world was organized so that we wouldn't, well, you know. And of course, that's still true today. Where we live is determined largely by race, who we interact with. Uh, I mean, the, the interactions across racial lines are, are intentional and, and relatively rare. You have, to, you have to go out of your way for them. Um, our, our, the pattern of our cities, where, where we live, who we have dinner with, who we marry, and everything is, is driven by race, and so are our politics. I, I do remember in, in um, for me, my dad was in the dry cleaning business. Um, I had a strange upbringing because uh, we were kind of working class. Um, he had several laundries. I started working in the laundry when I was five years old. Um, but then I got recruited off a little league field to go to Westminster, which is this fancy school there in Atlanta. So I went there on, they said they didn't have academic athletic scholarships, but I assure you that if, if I mean, the head of the history department came to the Little League field uh, to get me to come there. So I went there with the sons and daughters of the Atlanta elite. So I knew that none of my friends at Westminster had any contact with any black people at all, except maybe the maids in their house. But all my dad's employees were black, and I lived and worked with them. And he would take me to funerals, and <laughs> I would drive. And, and when the movement started, one way for me to feel uh, an, um, segregation in a way was, was to talk. I couldn't talk to those. If I talked to them about protests, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't acknowledge it. It would be scary to them. They were afraid to talk to you. They were afraid to talk to me about that. But, but they weren't afraid to all but spank me and, you know, and tell me what to do. Uh, so I was kind of this strange... Um, they would scold me, they would tell me what to do, they would show me how to iron a shirt, they would <laughs> show me how to do all this, but their personal lives, and, and I saw the, my dad joked with them. Um, we went to Atlanta Crackers games with some of them, that was the name of our, of our baseball team, um, believe it or not. Um, and, um, and then they would have to go sit in the colored section. That, it, in my whole life, my early life, that was the only time I really felt personally uh, the color line is when we'd go down to Ponce de Leon Ballpark and we'd have to split up uh, to go to the game. Um, but I, to this day, I can remember probably 30 of my, my dad's employees, uh, and I knew them, but as I got older, like I got in high school, I began to realize I knew what songs they sang. I'd been to their churches, but I'd never been in their homes. I didn't know that much about their lives. Uh, that there were these, there were these veiled curtains, you know. And I think that's, to, to a large degree, the way we still are. Oh, yeah. My mom was kind of a UN liberal. My mom, my mom, she's proud of letters that she had writing to Coretta. Uh, so, um, but, but I don't really think that distinguished me from a lot. Even with of the Westminster kids, we were all taught to be polite and not to use racial epithets and that sort of thing, that that was terrible and that that was something only that, you know, um, tobacco-chewing sheriffs did. Um, but we were also taught to leave, leave that alone and um, uh, th those issues w weren't issues that concerned us. So it was, it was an issue of distance, really. Um, I don't remember any, I don't really remember the start of the sit-ins. I was in the ninth grade. Um, I mean, I knew the Freedom Rides were going on, but I don't remember any 
the first thing that really, I have vague memories of all these things, but I wasn't political. The first one that really pierced me were those pictures of the children in Birmingham in May of 63. I'm 16 years old. I can finally drive a car and go out in the world. So I could have driven across town if I wanted to, but I, I didn't know where to go, so I didn't. But I was profoundly affected by the pictures of those kids. Um, you know, because he, he was very proud of how he was friends with Sloppy Floyd and all these guys in the Georgia legislature. So he would tell me about that. I remember the Supreme Court case, that it was an, an embarrassment that our legislature was, was throwing him out and pretending that, pretending that it was only because of Vietnam, and, uh, he, which would be bad enough to say that you, we can't have somebody that disagrees with us about a war. But it was also racial, and that was, that was obvious. Um, it was all bound up, you know, it was around the time or just before Lester Maddox, the year before Lester Maddox. You know, I was in college then and I remember it, but <clears throat> it was interesting because by the time I got to college, and I was out of Atlanta, I was in Chapel Hill most of the year, and, and the world was shifting from civil rights uh, already to Vietnam. And um, uh, some of the civil rights protesters were already doing anti-Vietnam protests, so I don't really remember I certainly knew who Julian was very well um, by the time 68 came. I, that's my senior year in college, and, and we, um, I went looking for him. That was my job. I, went, I don't know how I found him, but I found him and went looking for him. I had been involved in my senior year um, with the McCarthy campaign because of Vietnam. We were looking for somebody to run against Johnson to end the war. Um, and I went uh, out to Kentucky. For, for McCarthy. I went to Indiana um, and I met some of the student leaders, uh, um, Sam Brown, David Mixner, David Hawk of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee. They were just a couple of years older than I was. And they sent me out and I met people in the McCarthy campaign. Um, and they were the first ones who told me we should mount a challenge um, in Georgia. Uh, um, and I talked about that with them, and so then when Plus, when I went to Indianapolis, I had a famous, semi-famous incident, because I was, I was canvassing for Gene McCarthy, and um, I was flying home from Indianapolis after McCarthy lost to Bobby Kennedy in the, in the first head-to-head -head race on May 7th, 1968. I was flying home for my draft physical because I'd been drafted, full of drama as only people who lived through that era uh, know because I was engaged and I had told my parents and my future wife's parents that if I passed the physical, I was not going to go. Um, I wasn't going to go be a medic and I wasn't going to Canada. I was going to refuse induction. Um, but I didn't expect to pass the physical because I'd had a terrible automobile accident and had a large part of my right hip taken out. So in any sane year, they wouldn't even have looked at me. But this was right after the Tet Offensive, and the word was that they were drafting anybody who could stand up. And um, so I'm sitting in, a, in the airport in Indianapolis, dejected because McCarthy's lost to Kennedy and that I missed my flight and I've got to get an early morning flight and I don't have any money for a hotel so I'm sitting on my suitcase all night and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and it was Bobby Kennedy who I'd just been seeing on TV all night. And he saw that I had a McCarthy staff badge on and said, excuse me, would you have breakfast with me? It was like midnight. And um, anyway, um, I said, sure, I was dazzled and, and Somehow the breakfast place, it was a Dobbs house in the Indianapolis airport, opened up. And we went there, and I kid you not, at 4.30 the next morning, we were still arguing about Kennedy's name and why he didn't get in earlier and why. He wanted to know why students who were get, he said, I'm getting the C students, I'm getting the frat boys, and, and McCarthy is getting the A students, and why don't those A students realize that he would be a terrible president? Uh, and he was closer than you. I mean, we were just like this, going back and forth all night. And I was utterly dazzled um, by it. And, um, and there was a, a student from Pembroke, a female student, 
um, that I've never been able to find. And we were so dazzled together, but we hung out from, we held out for McCarthy, but we were mightily impressed with Kennedy. I've never had an experience like that with anybody in politics that was so raw. He would just say, I can't help what my name is. All I can help is what I can do with it. And yes, I was for the Vietnam War, and I think people who were for it understand how hard it is to change and how and have an, uh, a leg up on, on, on persuading people who are still for the war. Anyway, we went back and forth, and when it was all over, she and I sat and rehashed everything on a legal pad and went over and, 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 and told Kennedy how much we admired him and, and what an amazing experience it was. And it, it shows what a different world it was. He told us that he was staying in the motel across the way because he was flying out the next morning too. We walked over and slid our manifesto that basically rehashed everything we talked about for four hours under the door of his room. That's what the security was like. You know, no wonder he was, he was killed, you know, a month later. So this is May of 68, a month after Dr. King was killed. Um, I, I, of course, have vivid memories of that, and a month before Kennedy himself was killed. And um, um, I did flunk my draft physical, so I did go ahead and get married. And then almost instantly, and, and I taught that summer uh, at Westminster in the summer school. And that's when I, I had all these contacts from the McCarthy people, and they said, can we do something in Georgia the only way to do it is to get a coalition of the other campaigns. There was the Humphrey campaign. I think McGovern was just beginning to start. Um, can we find people, can we find a coalition of people who would know how to form, uh, mount a challenge? Our model was what the Mississippi Freedom Democrats had done in 1964. And by that time, I was very interested in that. So um, it was those people from the presidential campaigns who said, we need a spokesperson. Uh, of color um, to, to be a leader for, for, for this group, and you guys go find them. So Parker and I, I don't know whether I did it by myself or I, whether I did it with Parker. We did a lot of stuff together. Who was Parker? Parker Hudson um, was somebody I didn't know very well, but we were in, we went to North Carolina together. He was a year behind me in high school at Westminster, so I didn't know him at all. And, and he was not a football player or a jock, um, so I didn't know he was younger. Um, but he went to North Carolina and graduated in three years. He was very smart and got, won a Marshall Fellowship at, uh, at the London School of Economics. And we, so we were leaving at the same time in 68. And when I got to Atlanta, he, I don't know how he got interested in it. You'll have to ask him. But the two of us became like the Bobsy twins. We would go all around. We met Ben Brown. We met John Lewis. Um, and Julian, and we said, um, and, and some of them were divided in their presidential sympathies for that year. Some were already for, like John was already for Bobby Kennedy, uh, but, but then Bobby Kennedy was killed, so he was at a loss. But the idea of having a challenge against Lester Maddox, people have a hard time remembering how undemocratic it was. He appointed all the delegates, and they were, they were I, if I'm not mistaken, all but two or three were men, and they were all white, and they were all for the Vietnam War. So, I mean, Putin couldn't have, couldn't have been more autocratic than Lester Maddox was. So, so everybody, even Humphrey, who was considered to be the, um, the most conservative of the Democratic contenders, uh, Johnson's vice president, because he wouldn't openly denounce the Vietnam War, even Humphrey's people did not want to be on the wrong side of a challenge against Lester Maddox. Uh, so there were people from the labor unions. Anyway, but we went and asked Julian, will you lead this? Here's our plan. We, we need to have a convention that's modeled on, on the convention that they had in Jackson uh, with Ella Baker speaking in 64 to and, and draw, draw people from all over the state to have an, an election and go through and elect delegates and, and make it black and white, although it's going to be predominantly black. Um, and, and, and go up there and challenge. And, um, and he eventually said yes. So then, then it was a question of um, frantic work on weekends and, and playing hooky from my teaching job because the job that Julian gave me, 
was to go around the state of Georgia to speak in black churches and recruit people to come to our convention in Macon. We had a convention in Macon in early August of 68. Um, and um, people came from all over Georgia and it was like a, a convention. Al Carer, that's a lot of these names are going to be very fuzzy. I didn't write a history of it. Parker did. He wrote a history of Al Carer, K-E-H-R-E-R. He was like an AFL-CIO uh, labor union leader, and he was um, um, openly supporting Humphrey. And Charlie Negaro, N-E-G-A-R-O, was a staff person for Gene McCarthy, and he was down there bringing uh, a limited amount of uh, funds from the McCarthy campaign. Charlie Negaro, I think he was from Danbury, Connecticut or somewhere, but he was a traveling staff person. For, so what you would see at this convention was um, you would see spokespeople from, from the various campaigns and activists. Um, Eliza Pascal uh, was like a civil rights activist. A lot of civil rights activists were there. We had this big convention in Macon. And um, because Parker and I had done so much of the legwork, we were basically the chief gophers for this thing. Um, but I don't know, there were five or six hundred people at this convention at a minimum in, in this hotel. And we elected these delegates. Most of them were poor. And I had had these eye-opening experiences driving around Georgia, going into black churches, appealing to people to come to this convention. Why come to this convention? What does it mean? What's our model? What did they do in 1964 with Fannie Lou Hamer? Uh, and, um, and how we were planning to do that for Georgia, why our cause was right, and why the supporters of several different um, presidential candidates, while they had their differences over which uh, person they wanted to nominate for president, they all wanted to cooperate in this challenge delegation. Um, so. So you, you make this conscious effort to go find Julia Fox, and you do. And we met in hotels. I remember, I don't know if it was the first meeting or not, but I remember a long meeting when he brought Ben Brown, who had been elected to the Georgia Senate, I think, and he brought John. So it was Julian and Ben Brown and John Lewis and Parker and myself, and maybe Charlie Negaro was there. And he was there for some of our meetings. I mean, we had a lot of them once they got committed. But early on, when we were trying, are you on board? Does it matter that you're supporting different presidential candidates? Is it a waste of your time if you're in the Georgia legislature um, or not? Uh, what will your role be? Um, uh, we, we had a lot of these meetings. And that's when Julian and I became acquainted. I was starstruck by him. You know, I'm 21. I just graduated from college, and he's he's already had two cases go to the Supreme Court. Or whatever. So um, I was working for him, um, but I was doing a lot of the legwork, and I, it it was a wonderfully fulfilling for me because you're, when you're trying to do something for which there's no model and there's no ball, you're inventing. You're, what do we need to do now? Where are we going to get the money? What do we need to do next? Who do we need? Um, how do we, now that we've elected this challenge delegation, we're saying that it's a challenge delegation, but how do we present our case in, um, in Chicago? And we had some lawyers. There was a, we had a lawyer, and I'm not, George something. George, oh, we, I think maybe we had more than one lawyer. They, um, but we had to we had to find expertise. We had to find grown-ups. Um, Julian was kind of a grown-up, but even he was, he was only twenty-eight um, uh, to 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 present a case to the Democratic Convention. Um, so once we had we had a list of delegates that we had elected in 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 Macon, and then we got together, and there were then it had expanded. You had these lawyers and people from the AFL-CIO. Who's going to go to Chicago to present this case? Because we assumed that the odds were overwhelmingly negative, that we would not be seated. And our model was like Mississippi, that we wouldn't be seated in 68 and that we might be seated in 72 if we presented a good case about how anti-democratic, non-democratic the Georgia procedures were.
So the shock troops went up to Chicago. I, I don't know how we paid our way, but that was just Parker and myself and Julian and the lawyers and Al Carer, the guy from the AFL-CIO. So only a, Ben Brown didn't go, John Lewis didn't go. Um, by that time, by the way, I had already made, no, maybe not. I, I worked for John Lewis at the Voter Education Project the next summer, in the summer of 69. But that grew out of all of this. So anyway, it was a very small group that went to, went to Chicago, and I went with Julia, and that's when we started to become close, because he was kind of our spokesperson. But we were moving around, he was already giving press interviews, and, and I, I did every, I, I, I joked, and he remembered this, I ironed his shirts and that sort of thing. Well, you and had the background for it. I had, that's right, from, my, from the cleaners. And I also, um, I also, he was very busy, and he assigned me to talk to his wife, Alice, back in Atlanta. And he told me that I needed to know what the top songs were on the R&B pop charts. <laughs> to talk to her to keep her entertained. Uh, so I, I did that. And anyway, we went through all of these hearings and I showed you that photograph. I had never seen it before of us. We were strategizing, you know, what are our most, what are our best arguments? Who's on the committee? What are they asking us? And then much to our surprise, they split the delegation and awarded us. They basically said, we're seating both delegations, Lester Maddox's delegation and the challenge that we were called the challenge delegation. We call ourselves the loyal, the Georgia loyal Democrats, but we were the challenge delegation. Uh, we were trying to say we were loyal because Lester Maddox's people were going to vote for George Wallace. Right. They weren't even going to support the nominee of the Democratic Party. Um, so um, when we got seated, it rang a big alarm. How are we going to get 60, I don't know the number, 65 delegates, mostly poor, who were back in Georgia and had no expectation that they had done anything except have a weekend adventure in Macon because we didn't think we were going to get seated. Now all of a sudden they're seated, the convention starts next week, and how are we going to get them up here and where are they going to stay and where are we going to raise the money? And um, that's when um, I, I, w I was frantic. I went around, I, I bet I went to 25 hotels uh, in Chicago and they were all booked up. They'd been booked up forever. And I finally got so desperate because Julian, Julian would say to me, you're in charge of logistics, find the money and fly the people up here. You know, I've got, a, I've got interviews to do. Um, and because he was very droll like that. He assumed that I could do anything. And I finally went back to him. I said, I don't, we're not going to get a hotel even if we can find the money. Uh, to, to, to get the airplane tickets. I've made the airplane reservations. I've made a down payment. You know, we're, we're trying to get people up here, but we don't have a place for them to stay. And so he said he was going to go see Elijah Muhammad, the head of the Nation of Islam. And um, I did not get to go because Elijah Muhammad would not have white people in his house. Um, Julian says that they didn't even take me over there. My memory is that I went and kind of sat on the outside. I know I didn't go in. He's right about that. I didn't go in. And he was gone for a long time, and he came back, and he had a big big stash of cash from, from the Nation of Islam to, um, to help fly these people up there. So now we could pay for the airplane reservations. And the next morning, he sent, oh, and I'm not, not going to remember his name, this big burly black guy comes over and Julian told him that I was the logistics man and he said what hotels have you gone to and I had this long list and he said let's go to the Del Prado and I said they're gonna laugh at us because you know I told him we went there he walks up with me and says we need 35 rooms or 40 rooms I forget what it was uh, for the whole convention and the guy says uh, let me get my manager I know his name, Walter, I'll remember his name, but he was Elijah Muhammad's um, fixer. The guy he, that's with you. The guy that's with me. Uh, I didn't get to go into, the, into Elijah Muhammad's house, and Julian described all of that in the dinner, and the women sat over here, and the men sat over there, and they said, why should we help this boy? Because Elijah Muhammad taught that they shouldn't be involved in politics. That, yeah, that was kind of curious, that that's... Why should we help 
this man, you know, because American politics are corrupt and we teach our people to be out of it. And he said the women were, I think he said the men were against it, the women were for it. And Elijah Muhammad said only one vote counts and I'm going to help this young boy, even if he doesn't know what he's doing or something. I, um, but anyway, he helped him. And Walter Turner, Walter Turner shows up and we went to the Del Prado Hotel and he disappeared into the back room. And this guy that I hadn't seen before wearing a coat and tie comes out about five minutes later and says, well, I think we found you 40 rooms or however many. <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather. This guy, I don't know what it's like. And I do remember Julian and I, after that, we went out on the town with him a couple of nights between the hearings and when the convention started. And um, when you walk into a nightclub with Walter Turner, it was like, the Red Sea parted because he, he had this huge wad of money. I mean, it was like a gangster thing. Um, uh, but everybody uh, just uh, would quake uh, uh, around him. But anyway, he, he got us these rooms, and uh, then the convention started. And that was, I was with Julian the whole time. We would walk, and he got nominated for vice president. That was, you know, that was an important moment in Julian's life. We would talk about it later. The uh, convention um, was chaotic. It's really only remembered in history for the violence that broke out um, late in the convention. Uh, early in the convention, we were trying desperately to have a, a plank against the Vietnam War to, and, and, and a stronger plank on civil rights. Um, so th there was a lot of contention going on, and one vehicle for saying that the that the convention was being too scripted by Humphrey's people and, and Lyndon Johnson to, to not to make a break with what Johnson had been doing, even, even though this was that pivotal year of 68, um, w was that um, they wanted to nominate Julian for vice president as a symbol of change in youth. That if Humphrey was... You know, we're still challenging Humphrey and hoping we can break through and somehow uh, shatter his delegates and get them to switch. You know, there were demonstrations on the floor. Um, most of Lester Maddox's delega delegates left, by the way. They refused to sit with us because we were integrated. Um, so we basically had all the seats. And we're on the floor and we're running around letting other people in and sh swapping our badges. And We had badges to get on the floor. Um, and one of the plans was to nominate Julian for vice president. And I think it was an important moment for Julian, not just because it was an honor, but because it was a national audience for his, um, his natural gift. The interviews, because I was standing next to him for a lot of these interviews. And, and he, he took it as kind of a joke, but it was very serious. He was a, he was a, he was a, a militant civil rights leader with a with a who didn't take himself too seriously, who could joke, and he had this he had this mild voice, and he would laugh and and that sort of thing, and people would say, you know, you're too young, and he said, well, I don't you like to change the Constitution if they really want me, but I'm flattered to be here. He he just, he just took it with such grace that I think he 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 won over lots and lots of people who said. Well, maybe he can't be vice president, but, but that's somebody we're going to need to get to know. Uh, so from the standpoint of a national audience, I think a lot of people who may have remembered that there was a story about a Supreme Court case over whether he should, nobody cared about the Georgia legislature. But for him to be in the middle of that chaos, this, and again, this is before all of the violence, because once the violence broke out, the convention, you know, that was toward the end of the convention. And it really didn't involve us very much. We're inside the convention. I think there was one night, and this is after the vice presidential um, thing, but once Julian's nominated for vice president, he's getting interviewed anyway. He's getting, he became a, kind of a go-to person for the press, so he got to comment on things. And whenever he got to comment, he would, he would, it, would it would give him a chance to, to, to vent his, his mixture of wisdom and humor. Um, uh, when the violence broke out, the only thing I remember there, and I was with Julian, we had a march of delegates by candlelight all the way from the amphitheater down to Grant Park, which was where most of the violence was. And we, 
we would go into the, um, can't remember whether we were in the Palmer House or the Del Prado, the, uh, not the Del Prado. There were two hotels right next to the, Sh the Sheraton and the Palmer House where, where the presidential candidates were staying and a lot of the violence was around there. I saw somebody get thrown through a plate glass window and there was tear gas down there, but we were marching with candles and, and we were all in suits and, you know, we were all in suits. So we were somewhat separated. We weren't in the, out in the violence, but some of the people who were delegates uh, got, got beaten up and all of us got tear gas. Um, and I, Julian did not like violence. I mean, that's one of the things he would say right from the beginning. He would say, I did one demonstration in 1960 and I didn't want to go to jail anymore and I didn't want to get beaten up anymore. But I would support the people who were. Um, um, that was his upfront persona. I mean, he would say that to John Lewis. He would say that to anybody in the movement. Uh, my expertise is running the communications. I'm a poet. Um, I'm a spokesperson. I'm in the legislature. Um, so anyway, that's about all I remember about the convention. Well, part of that was his voice. He had a very mellow voice, and it, it was soothing. And, and he, he would often speak with a little hint of a smile, even when he was not making a joke. And um, I think those things were, were effective in the way he communicated. But, but he was spontaneously eloquent. Very early on, you know, I was, a, I was, as I said, starstruck. I would ask him about his association with Dr. King, and I think it was very early that he told me that he had written um, some poem about Dr. King on the basis of his of his uh, interaction with him, something like, um, uh, oh, the, the, look at that girl, shake, shake that thing, we yeah. can't all be Martin Luther King. <laughs> he yeah. said, that's, that's how I knew, that's how I knew Dr. King. So, you know, um, he was disarming, he could be disarming. Now, he, his favorite speech then, he was developing his stock speech because, um, which was the fire next time. Uh, uh, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. So it was like, you know, um, if white America doesn't shape, shape up, uh, there's going to be fire next time. So he, he gave a kind of blistering speech, but he would, he would give it in, in, um, in such a way that he, he was constantly in demand for wh white audiences. But I, I didn't go on many of those speeches. Yeah. Well, I don't know too much about his work with SNCC. I mean, I know what it was, and I know what he was doing, but um, um, I spent more time interviewing Bob Moses and people like that right. out uh, the field organizers. He, he's in the he's in the office. Uh, most of the people that I interviewed s said what m makes sense if you know Julia which was that he had kind of a natural uh, education, ed educated bearing. Oh, I remember that one of the first things he told me was that <laughs> when I drove around Georgia to try to recruit people to come to the Make Convention and go to black churches, I was stunned because I had just met Julian and he was on big Coca-Cola ads, um, I mean circles, Sure, it was Coke. It had to be Coke. It wasn't Pepsi. But oh, this in Georgia, it's, it's Coke. Yeah, it's Coke ads, <laughs> you know, nailed to the side of a barn, and and he'd be there smiling. He was very handsome. You know, Julian Bond was Harry Belafonte handsome, and um, he told me he told me that he got to do those things because he was so light skinned that they wanted to have light skinned people, uh, light skinned black people, to market Coca Cola to black people, um, and. He, he said that at uh, Morehouse that he, he could go, he said we have a problem of colorism within the black community and that he could go to parties that he called paper bag parties at Morehouse where they would have a grocery bag nailed to the door and if you were darker than the color of an ordinary grocery bag, you couldn't get in. And he, and he said I was always able to get in anywhere because I'm, you know, because of my light skin. And he would make fun of himself but he wouldn't make fun of his education, you know, that his father, I mean, I learned very early, he told me that his father was a college president and the son of a college president and, and that education was really important. 
it was only later when we got to be closer personally that he told me how, how much it hurt his father and his mother um, that, that he dropped out of school. Uh, they wanted him to be a professor and an educator just like his heritage. And he talked about being literally baptized into the talented tenth by W.B. Du Bois in a ceremony in their home. You know, this is like you're being baptized into the talented tenth black elite. Um, you're, you're light enough to go on the Pepsi ads <laughs> and you're educated enough to be a leader of your people and that, the, and that the best way to lead them is through education and that his family was disappointed. Years later, um, in 1994, Julian and I drove from Atlanta to Jackson for the 30th anniversary of Freedom Summer with Pam um, and we took Julia, his mother. Um, in the car, and I'll never forget uh, Julia saying that she she wished that her husband had lived long enough to see Julian a university professor like he always should have been, um, and that's what she's. So to them, it was famous. However famous he could get as a civil rights leader, it, it was it was it was a detour from what he was meant to do, which was to teach in school. Well, I think some of it was his a lot of it was his education. You're right, but um, you know, gay rights was not a not a big issue uh, to his family. Or, you know, most Americans most Americans telescope our memory of gay rights. I mean, 30 years ago, um, marriage equality was not in the imagination of the most radical person there. So things have moved really rapidly. But there was. Um, there were gay people in SNCC, you know, there was Bayard Rustin all around. I knew Bayard fairly well. Bayard was kind of closeted even to the very end of his life. Everybody thinks that he was out his whole life and so on and so forth. Um, it was a very powerful, constraining, nasty force. But Julian, I'm like Cortland. I would I would have been surprised if Julian hadn't said this is wrong and and been sympathetic and protective of of of, of people who were gay. But he was also funny about it. Um, we got honorary degrees at Dillard University the same year. I forget what year it was. Um, Julian and I and John Lewis, the three of us. And what I remember is that the people from Dillard, uh, forget the, the press, I knew the president. I had interviewed the president of Dillard for Parting the Waters. And um, he called me and he said that one of the reasons he wanted to do this was to try to heal the breach between John and Julian from the 1986 election, which was real. Uh, you know, they, that was a brutal, nasty, it was, you know, personal. Uh, campaign. Um, it, there were elements of class and education and everything and personal failure and drugs and everything else in it. Um, and the, the, the president of Dillard wanted to know if I could try to be a mediator between the two of them. And um, so we went down there and we went out to a restaurant together. Have you heard this story? We were at Lucky Ching's. I didn't know anything about Lucky Ching's. And I think Julian and Pam cooked this up um, to get John because John is very, very conservative and 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 proper. And um, Julian and Pam are, com as you say, they're cosmopolitan and comfortable in all kinds of settings. And so um, we we went there, but I do think this was really instrumental in helping to um, heal the breach between the two of them because. In those, I don't think the word transvestite is proper anymore, but in those days, all the waiters at Lucky Chang's were, were transvestites, and our waiter was a, clearly a man in a dress and high heels and stockings and, and flamboyant makeup, and the waiter came and plopped down in John Lewis's lap um, at our table. Um, I, I think the waiter had an instinct for who, who the most squeamish person was and picked on him that way and John to his credit um, 
um, summoned up. I mean, he was uncomfortable, but he talked to her and or him and asked questions and everything. And um, when the waiter left, John scolded Julian. Well, actually, all of us said, "Whose idea was this?" and so on and so forth. But it really kind of broke the ice, and um, uh, all of us. I know I, and I'm pretty sure Pam and Julian and I talked about it after we admired the way Ju uh, John handled it, be because it's not something that he would have sought out to do. But you know, by this time, I guess he'd been in Congress for a long time, and he was he was more accustomed to dealing with uh, odd situations. So, uh, yeah, that was Lucky Chang's, um, and but see, that was easy for Julian. He loved things like that. I had a big gap in my relationship with with uh, Julian. Um, after after Chicago in '68, um, I went to graduate school, uh, and I didn't get to see him very much, uh, except when we were in Atlanta. But I did work for John Lewis in the VEP in the summer of '69, and so when I was in Atlanta, um, I would go see Julian, and I saw him into the '70s. Um, but then he's in Atlanta and I'm in Washington, and um, I didn't get to see him very much. Um, was this when you had begun working for uh, Charles Peters? Yeah, I was. Monthly. Yeah, at the Washington Monthly, and then at Harper's, and I'm all over the place and uh, writing and and trying to be a freelance writer. It was it was very difficult. I, I saw him when I started. I started the King work in 1982. So I think from say. 72 or something like that until 82 in the 70s I didn't see a lot of him. he was in the state Senate he was you know he was busy and uh, he was in Atlanta and I would only run across him occasionally um, then when when parting the waters came out um, I got invited to do a lot of speaking engagements and um, I was in I was at the Schomburg in New York at a speaking engagement, and I had seen Julian a little bit, uh, and and he had, and and I met Pam, but hardly we we hadn't really renewed our uh, acquaintance because we'd been apart in many ways for for a good bit, and um, I remembered Alice and you know the strains in his marriage from uh, from that, and. I had done all these interviews for Parting the Waters on the relations between men and women, uh, black men and, and uh, white women, uh, white, white men and black women, and that sort of thing. And I'd interviewed an awful lot of women, black women, who said that, uh, that the, the relationship between the genders were totally different across the racial lines. That that for black women, the odds were so much against them, if you're an educated black woman, to find a comparably educated black man, uh, that it had been a, a, a constant for virtually the entire 20th century that black families investigated scarce educational resource in the women and not in the men. That three quarters of the women uh, of, of college graduates were females and not males. And sure enough, what, when I went to interview Professor Sam at Dillard years before we got the honorary degree, he had his class roster there, and his it was 70% female, and he says it's always been 70% female. So these women were talking. To, I basically I talked at the Schomburg about the hidden sociology of the relationship between women, and that we we talked. We talked lightly about whether there was flirting and interracial affairs at Freedom Summer and all of that business, but that it was it was a profound, it was a serious subject, um, that um, that the personalities of a lot of black women told me that their personality was I don't need a man I'm on my own I'm probably if I do have children I may I'm probably going to have to raise them by myself, and they said that there was this sense of strong. Uh, independence in in black women that they said was really undercut by if they ever found somebody like Julian or, or or somebody that was eligible they became there was a there was a streak of desperation and and that 
underneath all of that, if a white woman came and waltzed away with a Harry Belafonte or a Julian Bond, as was common, uh, they felt um, a, an impulse of rage against them because they didn't feel that the white women had any sense of, of, of what the acculturation was uh, for, for black women in, in, the, in the marriage market, basically. So I gave this little talk, which was totally out of my depth. But they were asking me uh, things about the personal side of the movement. And I said, you know, uh, Julian Bond has just married uh, a white woman. And uh, I guarantee you that there are a lot of black women in Atlanta that are upset about that. And I don't really know what Julian thinks about it uh, or, or whether he cares. Um, and I shouldn't have said that. Um, I was just trying to talk, saying this is a really interesting subject that nobody talks about because there's this, you know, white society is so hard on black men um, that they're so disadvantaged. You, you look at the ones that are in prison, uh, the ones that have died, um, the ones that are uneducated, the fact that white society has cut off a lot of the, um, um, of the professions uh, that, that would be open to educated black men, uh, and that over time, it, meaning many generations, this has an effect on, on the culture, not, uh, not just on um, politics. Um, and Joanne Grant was at this talk, and she, she called Julian within five minutes of walking out of there saying that this guy was talking about his marriage and who he married and the fact that he married a white woman and how significant this was and so on and so forth. And I got a call from Julian uh, out of the blue, you know, you shouldn't be discussing my personal affairs. And I, I said, well, Julian, I, I was... I was talking about what I had learned in the larger issues of sociology and the relationship between men and women uh, across the racial divide. Um, but I'm sorry that I mentioned you. Um, and um, anyway, we had a long conversation about it. And the irony is that uh, across the divide, that reconnected us. Uh, this is like. 30 years ago. Our relationship started 50 years ago. We had an intermittent relationship for a long time, but then because we were separated and we were in different careers and he was in... And then, of course, after 86, he moved up to Washington and so we, it was much easier to get together. So, by way of apologizing for mentioning him at the Schomburg <laughs> and getting off into sociology, um, uh, Pam and Julian and Christy and I started having, you know, seeing each other a lot and even going on trips together. We went to the, we went to the Freedom Summer Reunion twice. I think I told you about one in 1994, the 30th anniversary, uh, when uh, his mother went with us, right. when Julia went with us, drove with us, and that was wonderful just to be around. If you're around Julia Grant, you could see where 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 Julian came from, just such a sense of dignity and and um, uh, beautiful command of the language, and um, and immense pride in him. But saying she she wished that her husband had lived long enough to see Julian be a professor like he was supposed to have been all along. That was really great. Then 2014, just the year before Julian died, we went back for the 50th anniversary uh, together and spent some time. Um, by then, I, all my books were out, and I, I, I spent a lot of time with Bob Moses and so on. But one thing was, we were always doing, Julian usually found the odd things like Master and Commander, the Patrick O'Brien novel, or, or the Barnes Museum, and stuff like that. But I found one down in Mississippi, because we were driving around um, in Jackson, and I found this restaurant. Um, I was looking for an odd restaurant, and it was closed. And I talked my way in there. I forget the reason. All I remember about it, though, was that I grabbed, I insisted on driving Julian and Pam and Christy all across town to this restaurant, even when it was closed. And I knocked on the door and got them to let us in so that I could take Pam, take all three of them into the men's restroom because the men's restroom 
it was it, it was the Elvis Presley men's restroom, and over the oh <laughs> yes, that's it. Where'd you get that? So I must have so taken that instigator. picture. I was the instigator because I had found that, and I thought it was so neat that they had handlebars over the urinals, that, <laughs> so that the urinals were like motorcycles, <laughs> and then, and then there were quotes. You'd be a performer, so she's loving all this. There were quotes all around the bathroom. It was painted in all these uh, exotic colors, but there were quotes from Albert. I, everybody gave a quote about Elvis, Albert Einstein, and Lady Gaga, and you know, I mean, just. Bob Dylan, everybody gave a quote about Elvis, and it was all around the room. And Pam and Christy, I mean, they were excited to be in a men's restroom, but they said, are all the men's restrooms like this? And I said, no, they're not, but it, it was a riot. Uh, so that was 2014, just a year. But Julian loved that. That's, he, he liked things that were offbeat, um, that would make you think a little bit, and, and, um, and that were funny. He was always very droll about Dr. King, you know. He was not snide. I mean, it was fashionable to call him the Lord and, and, and to be cynical. There were an awful lot of people in SNCC who would elevate themselves by, by, by treating King as, as, as a pupil who was learning um, uh, or as somebody who was frightened. Um, uh, Julian never did that. But he was very droll about how he was intimidated by Dr. King. He, he never said anything that was other than admiring of him. So I don't think he was like, he wasn't in the, um, the hardcore radical. He was very tough on the Kennedys, though. Um, in what sense? He just thought, he, he thought the Kennedys were, got far too much credit for civil rights uh, relative to what they did. Um, um, particularly President Kennedy. But the fact of the matter is that civil rights was uh, more abundant in the water um, when, when Kennedy was killed and, and that his death gave it a bigger impetus than, than he had. He was pushed into everything he did. Uh, on the other hand, I thought, I thought um, so th that Julian was in the mainstream of being critical about the, the Kennedys. I thought he was out of the mainstream, and I sympathized with him because the more I studied it, the more I agreed with him. He was more sympathetic with Johnson than most people, not on the Vietnam War, but on civil rights. Um, it was fashionable to say that Johnson was a big cracker and he only did what he, would, what he had to do. Uh, I, don't believe, I don't think Julian felt that at all, and, and the, the time... Um, where it came out for me the most was his description of going to the opening of the Johnson Library. Uh, Julian went to the Johnson Library. He said it was the only time that he had ever been physically in Johnson's presence. He didn't go to any of those meetings. Um, and Johnson was an old man. It wasn't long before he died. I think it was in 72 or 3. This is part of our bonding because I met Johnson in 72 when Bill Clinton and I were the campaign managers in Texas for, for George McGovern. So we're down there and, jo and Johnson is the old, the old man, you know, uh, the old figure. And We went out to the ranch to get him to endorse George McGovern, barely. He barely endorsed him because, you know, McGovern was so anti-war. And um, Bill Clinton never forgave me. He claims that I cheated him out of going into the meeting. Um, with Johnson, but I remember Johnson, and, and it was I was just there for the introduction. They met privately, um, but Johnson had long hair like a hippie, and um, and shortly after that, after the election, he opened his library, and he and the first thing that he, collection that he opened was the Civil Rights Collection, and therefore Julian was invited, and he said Johnson made a huge fuss over him. And, but more than that, in the session, said why he had made civil right, why it was the most important thing that he did, and that you know he had made a, a lot of mistakes, but he thought this would this would last. And um, and Julian, I, I think he was moved by Johnson. I think he felt that Johnson was utterly sincere. That that this 
was a part of his life that had been consistent from the time when he taught Mexicans in Catulla, uh, you know, starving Mexicans, that, that Johnson had a poor person's uh, uh, humanistic uh, flesh, not an, not, a, not an abstract, but a, but a very personal sense of, of, of what cr black and white relations uh, ought to be, and that, that he deliberately wanted to make that the first part opening. And, um, Julian said he was uh, went out of his way to be nice to him at this opening. I, I, I'm sure you can find what the date was, but Julian told me that he was there and he described it um, elaborately. So um, we 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 had a lot of talks about because he had this personal uh, interaction, and uh, I'd listened to hours, hundreds of hours of Johnson's. Um, telephone conversations, which many of which still haven't been transcribed, thirty years later, um, and um, I talked to him about how, as a scholar, I listened to all these things and what I could feel from Johnson in in the conversations about uh, race and civil rights, um, or even about Vietnam, for that matter. I mean, uh, Johnson knew what was happening in Vietnam. He was not stupid. He knew we were going to lose the war. He just felt that if if and that, and he, and it was ripping him apart. But he said, "If I get out of the war, they'll, uh, there'll be a revolt. Americans will not accept somebody who loses a war." So he was afraid to be, um, afraid to pursue peace. Um, and, and you can feel that in these conversations. We had a lot of conversations about uh, about Johnson, and in a way, he and I were. I think maybe out of the mainstream for for different reasons, out of the mainstream of a lot of people who are very critical of Johnson. In our conversations, what he emphasized was he was there two or three days at the Johnson Ranch when they were opening the LBJ Library, um, and and he said Johnson pulled him aside and that he had direct conversation with him. If I could think about it, maybe I could remember some of the substance of the conversations that they, that he had. But we had long talks where I'm talking about how particularly listening to those tapes and going through the record changed my opinion of Johnson. Um, and, and he said the same thing from, from that long weekend when the library opened. Now, I don't know whether he had ever been, um, uh, hey, 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 LBJ, how many kids did you kill today, kind of um, uh, Johnson is a, is a blood-sucking capitalist monster. I, 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 I'm sure he wasn't ever that, but he may have been more cynical about Johnson than he, than he ended up. Well, I think the 60 to 68 period, aside from being a, a link to an almost forgotten America in which um, it, it wasn't shocking that a legislature would refuse to seat a black person um, in the legislature for being black and for and for being uppity, I guess, for criticizing a war. Um, that's hard for most Americans to imagine. And then when that person who was so primitively mistreated um, becomes famous because of the Supreme Court decision, America's introduction to that person revealed him um, uh, to be erudite, funny, well-read, eloquent, um, and tough uh, all at once, which was a mixture that you really, which was unknown um, with this mellifluous voice and, uh, and this humor. Um, so I think this, he's, he's a transitional figure from, from uh, totally segregated America, all of a sudden one of the first people to, to a crossover. He, he's not a crossover figure like Sam Cooke, or you know, in music, but he is in politics. All of a sudden, he's a person coming out of black politics, out of movement politics, who is a household word in white America. I can't tell you. He's like Harry. Um, but I, I, I've been friends with, with Belafonte almost as long as Julian, and you know, if you go out to dinner with Harry Belafonte, old white ladies are going <laughs> to are going to come up. Uh, swooning all over him um, from from a long time ago. Julian's like that. There are an awful lot of white people who admire him, and so I think the '60s um, period is a um, 
he is a transitional celebrity in, uh, in, in cross-racial uh, culture, mass culture. Um, and, and, and that's an important role. But that would have died out, you know. Um, I'm ignorant of what his legacy is from the work in the Georgia legislature, you know, the bills there and all of that. I don't, I don't know. That was when the period when we were separated. But I do know from the time he um, went into the NAACP that, that he was immensely proud of the work there. I mean, it was a mixture. To, to be honest, Julian said, you know, the NAACP is an unwieldy, nasty, <laughs> difficult organization. Uh, I think he said the board had 64 people on it. Uh, it's a monstrous board designed not to get things done, but to plan the next um, celebration at which all the board, he used to joke that there were more people on the dais at a lot of his meetings than there were in the audience. Um, that it was a difficult organization to move and, and yet um, he and Pam would always be talking about that work at, at, at our dinners and, and, and um, it, it meant an enormous amount to him to have that job as an elder states, states person, and he never thought he could get the NAACP to uh, endorse marriage equality. And I think that was one of the crowning moments of his achievement where you can take an old fashioned, uh, kind of stolid civil rights group and get them to take an advanced position that really, it had an enormous impact that the NAACP was for marriage equality because um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of traditionalists were counting on the fact that there are a lot of conservative ministers, you know, in the N NAACP who didn't go along with that. But I think Julian and Ben Jealous uh, kind of stared him down together. Um, uh, Julian, at the same, I mean, he introduced me to Ben Jealous, and uh, we were talking about in the same year. They got marriage equality, the DREAM Act, uh, and the end of capital punishment through in referendums in Maryland. Um, uh, that was a big deal. And the, and the NAACP, the governor at that time, Martin O'Malley, said it wouldn't have happened without the NAACP. It wouldn't have happened without Julian. He talked endlessly about how, to, how they got the resolution through. Uh, there was one particularly crabby old guy who wasn't there or something like that. But he still didn't think it was going to work. He, 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 he said it was... It was like the boldness of stating a position on the basis of objective truth. If, if, if anybody is hated, uh, we're risking all of us being hated. Kind of shamed the people that he assumed were against marriage equality. And it surprised him uh, that it went through. So I think uh, that kind of reconnecting the protest uh, uh, legacy at a level that's so far advanced. I mean, I, I, one day I think Americans will be amazed by how rapidly um, we went from uh, homosexuality being illegal, criminal, and something that people couldn't talk about. Uh, there were people in the civil rights movement who committed suicide out of fear that they would be outed as gay. That's how powerful it was. And to go from there to where we went and to have the NAACP be an instrument of that through Julian and um, uh, his work there is, is, a, is a great part of his legacy. So I think it meant a lot that he, um, and of course Obama, um, uh, I, I think all of those things meant a lot to him. Skip, you know, his America's Black Forum, his TV career, that was in that period when we were seeing each other intermittently. And I knew that was important to him. He loved that show, but we weren't close enough then. You'll have to find somebody else to talk about that period, but that's in that interim period. I'm talking about the 60s yeah. and then the, then the later period. Okay. Well, that's, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.